Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Ultimate General Civil War. We're gonna have a one day between the Panzer Corps series, so I started round two of the Panzer Corps World Championships yesterday. Uh, tomorrow will be the, the second part of that uh, multiplayer effort, uh, me against um, a Bluefin. But today we're going to jump back into our Ultimate General Civil War campaign because we've been, we've been revisiting this largely thanks to the game coming out officially on Steam. And I did want to go ahead and keep the series going. So again, we'll do every other day for Panzer Corps and we'll kind of keep coming back to Ultimate General until we complete this playthrough. And uh, I'm thinking probably around the weekend we'll get back to Cold Waters with some history. I'm reading a really good book. Uh, that I, I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I'm going to review or if I'm just going to jump back into the, you know, the U.S. boat history and kind of progress through to the Cold War and, and into the nuclear era, uh, which we finally reached. But that's all in the future. Today we're looking at Ultimate General Civil War. If you remember last time out, we won the Battle of Kettle Run. Uh, we lost a, a bit of our troops. We lost over 2,000 men, so it was a little bit expensive replacing our casualties. We've got the Second Corps up to full strength. We've got the First Corps at full strength. And we still have $15,000 and 7,800 recruits left over that we could start working on a Third Corps. So what I'm actually going to do now uh, is optimize some of my uh, my unit commanders here. So you can see here we have multiple batteries of artillery, but one is actually being led by a colonel. So I'm going to go ahead and switch that over because we have one lieutenant colonel in stock. We're going to go ahead and do that. Now you can see apparently the battery is large enough where we get a efficiency hit because we've got a lieutenant colonel instead of a general in charge because even the, the colonel actually had a penalty as well. Now I'm not going to go ahead and, and put, a, put a, a general in charge of my battery. I don't think uh, that would make a ton of sense at this time, but just worth calling out that this unit will be a little less efficient because of that. But the reason I did go ahead and decide to make that decision uh, of, um, you know, replacing him was because I need to free up another major general for command of the third corps. I'm not really going to build it out fully, but I do want to want to start the process of building the third corps because really, uh, in order to be successful later on in the game, you need to have more and more cores because even if you go just to the next major battle, which is second bull run, you can fight it with two cores, uh, but if you do it with with just two cores, you're you're fighting at a disadvantage. You know the vanguard, the main army; those two units have to be filled. But then you could theoretically have as many as five cores in this battle, and you're really selling yourself short uh, if you don't go ahead and do that. So we're gonna go ahead and back go back to the camp now. And we're going to go ahead and free up a major general. We've got one major general commanding a division. Uh, actually, two major generals. We've got John Gibbon commanding the 1st Division and uh, George McClellan commanding the 2nd Division in the 1st Corps. We had Ulysses S. Grant, but he was killed in a battle not too long ago. Uh, so that was uh, somewhat of an unfortunate uh, out out outcome. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and replace uh, General Buckley, who's currently commanding an infantry brigade in the 1st Corps. We're going to go ahead and replace him with Colonel Mark Harris. Uh, we don't get any penalty. A colonel is apparently sufficient to command a 2,000-man uh, brigade. We're then going to go ahead and put uh, the Brigadier General uh, Wesley Buckley in charge of the 2nd Division, uh, which I don't think we get a penalty for that either. It doesn't appear we do. And now we've got George B. McClellan, uh, a Major General, available to uh, give command of the 3rd Corps of the Union Army, or the Army of the Potomac, under me. So we can go ahead and do that, create a, a new corps here, and you can see here we've now got a 3rd Corps. We've got a General McClellan, and we can go ahead and give him a trait. Uh, he's a major general, so he gets the ability to have a trait there. And I think what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and give him the trainer trait. That would be very fitting for McClellan. He was a great organizer and trainer of men. Uh, and therefore, you know, more than more than anything else, that would be the most fitting one-star um, attribute. I guess he actually gets two attributes because he is a major general. So then we can choose to either give him a cavalry, an infantry, or an artillery uh, bonus. And we're going to give him an infantry bonus because my units tend to be infantry heavy, and I think that's also fitting for McClellan. So you can see there McClellan has those two traits. Uh, interestingly enough, our second corps is commanded by a one-star general, uh, which I think we should... Probably also remedy because we do have uh, a two star in the in the first division of the second corps under John Gibbon uh, currently in command. So let's see here. What else do we have? We don't have any other colonels just kind of laying around. We could use some of our money uh, to go ahead and, and put a colonel in charge, um, but it would make the second corps better if we put Gibbon in charge of the whole second corps. So we're gonna do that. Um, let's see here. I'm just not sure. 
how I want to go about doing it. Um, I don't really have... The spring, these three brigades are my best brigades, so I'm content living brigadiers in charge of them. Um, let's do... Can we do Lepin's Brigade? Can we put a lieutenant colonel in charge of him? Yes, we can. So Lepin's Brigade is going to become Pet Petit's Brigade, and uh, that frees Lepin up to command the 1st Division as a brigadier general. Quite experienced. He's almost a major general, actually, so that's a fitting promotion for him. And uh, there you go. Now we've got a two-star general available. Uh, to command the, um, wait, what the heck did I do that for? Okay, so we've got a two-star general uh, in Porter now, commanding the second corps, but we're going to go ahead and replace Porter uh, with John Gibbon. So there you go, Gibbon's got two traits, he's also going to be an XP and a and an infantryman. Um, actually, Gibbon was an artilleryman, so we'll go ahead and make him an artillerist. Uh, it may just make more sense to move some troops around, though, if that's going to be our objective, because the first corps has much, you know, has heavy, has a larger complement of artillery pieces than the second corps. So we're actually going to move some units around. We're going to go ahead and take McCook's six pounders, move them into the second corps. But before we do any of that, we're going to have to create a new division in the third corps. So there's actually some troops in the third corps. So we're going to go ahead and give a General Porter command a of a division in the third corps, the first division in the third corps. And there you go, that was, I think that was free, unless I just paid money and didn't even pay attention to it. Um, so what that's gonna do is that's gonna free up, uh, one artillery battery is gonna go there, so we're gonna go ahead and take, um, eh, who do we wanna take? I'm just kind of thinking like the the least impactful unit to lose. I don't wanna lose the Napoleons or the, uh, this is a big battery of guns, but we'll go ahead and put the, the 20 gun battery of McCook as the sort of backbone of the beginning of the first division. And uh, that's going to give all these divisions an equal number of artillery. I'm kind of wondering if cavalry makes a lot of sense um, in, in this corps. Maybe make the third corps more of a general purpose corps. I'm not quite sure. But we are going to raise one more infantry brigade uh, in the first corps. It'll be a green brigade. The first corps is already very heavily experienced. The Springfields, the Irish, and the Iron Brigade are by far my best units. You can see these things are crazy experienced. So we're going to go ahead and put an infantry brigade in the first corps. Uh, they'll be green. Uh, do we have any weapons currently? We've got some pattern Enfields. We've got some Harper's Ferries. Mm, that would all cost us more money than we can afford. So I think maybe we just stick with Springfields. It'll cost us almost the remainder of our money, but actually we can uh, alleviate that. I don't think we have any Harper's Ferry units, so we can sell those. And we can also sell the pattern Enfields because we have no units currently operating those. Then we can go ahead and uh, buy the infantry brigade, give them a, uh, a complement of Springfield 1842s. That'll use up pretty much the rest of our money and a chunk of our recruits. But there you go. The first corps is now fully built out, although we probably don't want a major in charge of infantry. I'm not going to use them in this battle, uh, so it's not as important. Um, but I, I didn't pay enough attention there. I gave a major command of, of an infantry uh, brigade. Actually, let's do this. Let's go ahead and give it to a lieutenant colonel. And then we can go ahead and move this battery back around to a major. So it still gives us a penalty here, but it's not quite as harsh. Plus, it's a brand new brigade, so the impact is a little bit less felt. These guys are really green. Um, so there you go. We, we just went ahead and assigned a lieutenant colonel command of Bass's brigade. He's a little bit more of a junior lieutenant colonel, so you do get an efficiency penalty, but not substantial, not a, not a huge one. And now we've got 16,000 infantry in the first corps, 1,200 artillery, 750 cavalry. That gives us 16,870 soldiers and 48 guns. The second corps is 18,120 men and 48 guns. So both corps have 48 guns. Both corps have 1,200 artillery. Uh, one is 16,000 infantry, one is 18,000. The difference is the first corps has some cavalry along with it as well. And then the uh, third corps is just getting started. All they have in it right now is a battery of 20 artillery pieces, uh, but we will uh, build that first division out, hopefully after this battle, so that we can use some of those troops in the upcoming battle of Second Manassas. All right, I think that about does it for this turn. You can see here we are still waiting on Brigadier General William Nelson to come back from being injured, and then we have a Captain Marvin Terry who's currently available. We could uh, go ahead and use some of our reputation. We've got 23 reputation we could spend to get more recruits, to get more money, to get more weapons. We've got enough to do any any one of those, uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna hold off on that for now, uh, and we're just gonna go ahead and fight the next battle.
Okay, so the next battle is going to be the Battle of Thoroughfare Gap. It says your main army is attempting to trap Jackson's left wing of the rebel army north of Manassas at Stony Ridge. Our scouts reported that Longstreet with the right wing is marching from the west to join with Jackson. We need to attack and crush Jackson before he's joined by Longstreet. Thoroughfare Gap is a good position to try and halt or delay Longstreet's advance. The main army is taking positions for the main assault, so you will only have to, you will only have one division available, more or less. So this is kind of based on uh, Longstreet historically had to move his army through Thoroughfare Gap before the Battle of Second Manassas to try and come to Jackson's aid. Jackson was facing off against the bulk of General John Pope's army by himself, which was Lee's plan. Lee launched a wide flanking maneuver, got around into the Union rear. Uh, and then Jackson attacked uh, Pope, but then Lee needed to come to Jackson's aid before Pope could bring the entire army to bear against him. Uh, Jackson found good defensive terrain near 2nd Manassas and hid there and actually took uh, Pope a long time to find him. But once he did and once he began attacking, uh, Longstreet's corps was still a little bit of a ways away to come aid him. Well, Longstreet was moving through Thoroughfare Gap. The Union had, I believe, a cavalry division under John Buford, although I could be wrong there, the late of later Gettysburg fame, uh, that was attempting to hold them up. And they did delay them for a little while, uh, but without support and without uh, any serious commitment from Pope to help Buford, uh, the defense was doomed and uh, Longstreet was able to get through the gap and come to Jackson's aid in time. You can see here, like all side battles, a big prestige hit if you lose, a very minor prestige bonus if you win, but the money and the recruits are really what we're going for. It sounds like we'll only have a portion of our force available to us at Thoroughfare Gap. Sounds like one division, uh, but the enemy is a little bit weaker. They're 2.5% weaker due to the fact that we beat them in the Battle of Kettle Run. So we'll go ahead and we'll move on. Uh, to the actual battle. You can see here we get 10 brigades, so a little bit more than a division. Uh, we're going to go ahead with the second core of the army. Uh, that's going to be the uh, force that we're going to deploy here. Um, and actually, real quick, before I forget, sorry to just randomly jump out here, but I want to give the uh, some of what I have left of my money is going to be added to the supply of the third core. I always forget to adequate supp adequately supply these forces, and 15,000 might be a little bit low as well uh, for multi-day battles, but we'll find out. So jumping back into Thoroughfare Gap, you can see here we're going to deploy our second core here, and you can see we'll have to leave two brigades behind. Uh, we are going to be on the defensive, so I'm not quite sure if I'll leave artillery or infantry behind, maybe one of each. Um, I find artillery is much more useful when you're on the, uh, on the defensive than on the offensive. All right, you can see here this says we've got 14 brigades, 19,820 men and 48 guns. The enemy has 21,000 men and 48 guns, if our intelligence is accurate. Go ahead and join in. General, our pickets report that Longstreet is approaching to the grab. Well, oh, I don't even know what accent that is. Your mission is to deploy your force and halt the rebels for at least three hours. Don't let them reach the crossing. Okay, so we need to hold this position. We've got some good wooded terrain to defend from, but they also have some terrain to approach through the woods. Um, I think in this case what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and place one battery of artillery here along the road line. They can hopefully fire on anything that they see coming along the ways. Uh, and then we're going to actually, maybe we'll deploy, eh, we're going to, we're going to shutter one artillery piece. Um, and that's going to allow us to bring in one more infantry piece. I think that's what we'll do. Alright, so... We've got our troops kind of in position already. We're going to go ahead and deploy. Actually, let's get these guys into the woods here and fire from the woods. We'll put Sedgwick in the woods. We'll advance here on the left a little bit. We'll put two brigades in these woods overlooking the flank. We'll advance the rest of our force into these woods and also a little bit to the south to protect ourselves from any flanking maneuver. I'm going to kind of set these guys up in the open so I can try and gain some benefit of speed getting into position first, and we'll hide our uh, supply wagon in the woods there. So we'll go ahead and start the battle, but then we're going to pause immediately. We're going to order Baxter's Brigade to move through the open and then into these woods. We're going to order Webb straight through the woods. Steering straight through the woods. Meanwhile, Nelson's going to detach some skirmishers. They're going to go forward in these woods to delay, or at least to kind of scout the enemy out. We'll have Sedgwick move into this terrain here. Loomis into this terrain here. We'll have Bass kind of be in reserve over here with the artillery. We'll have 
Hines move here. He's going to be kind of in reserve in the rear of the woods. And we're going to have Henry kind of stay where he is, and he'll be able to move him forward a little bit into these uh, into this uh, housing area, but we'll kind of leave him in reserve. I think that about does it for our orders. Looks like everybody minus the, uh, minus the wagons have orders, so we'll go ahead and start. You can see here we have to hold for three hours to win the objective. And let's actually get these guys moving on the double to get into position. They shouldn't be too tired. It's a short march, but I want to make sure they're there before the enemy shows up. If we do see their condition drop below 85, I'll switch them into not marching. Alright, we'll stop their march. We'll stop their double quicking. Interesting, those guys moving through the woods didn't get a penalty or didn't really get hit very hard for running. Kind of thinking about bringing Loomis into these woods here as well. Maybe a little bit more of a forward defense to try and catch the enemy in this open area rather than giving them some cover as they approach. Move Heinz up a little bit. Steering should be good there. You can see these guys are in good cover, 75, 85. Nelson Skirmisher is actually in 100. Let's move Baxter forward if that's really 100 um, terrain. We'll move Loomis up at the run as well. Maybe we move this artillery forward as well. This is all really good defensive terrain, apparently. It does leave our flank a little bit exposed. We'll actually move Bass over here. We'll move Nelson here. Okay. Oh, he's not in 100% cover. That's interesting. Maybe it's just because the skirmishers are such a small unit. Alright, so they are trying to go around our flank. That jerk. Oh my goodness. It's kind of epic like noises to say you've been you've spotted the enemy. Mostly skirmishers that Cedric's kind of turning to deal with. Oh god. Nelson's getting chewed up. It's actually not very good terrain here. Let's move back a little bit. Move you here. Alright, so we just lost Nelson's skirmishers who just surrendered. Loomis is in very good cover. He's engaging some skirmishers. Sedgwick is engaging skirmishers as well. It looks like Hood's going to try and go around his flank. We've got Bass coming up to support. Gibbon's going to move forward. We're having Baxter move back a little bit into a little bit better cover. And let's move these guys over here. Actually, let's move Henry over to this objective point here. We'll detach some skirmishers from Bass. We'll move him up on the flank, kind of, to try and deal with these skirmishers a bit. And we've got our artillery in position. Really rather you target these guys. I'm not too concerned about skirmishers knocking us out of position. Okay, it looks like the main push may come closer to the center. We're going to move these guys up a little bit. Keeping Deering on the flank just in case. Sedgwick was just wounded, which is just great. All 
Alright, so Sedgwick's just been wounded and now his brigade's in melee, which is not good as far as their uh, willingness to maybe continue fighting. Fortunately, we've got Bass over there as well. Alright, our artillery should be good to do some damage. Lorenz has the Lorenz rifle. Or, Nelson has the Lorenz rifle. He should be doing okay here. Alright, let's move Deering up here. It doesn't seem like the enemy's going to march around that flank. We'll have him detach some skirmishers just in case. We'll move him out over here. Meanwhile, we're moving Webb a little bit to threaten Hunton's flank move Baxter up a bit. Again, we caught the Confederates a little bit in the open. Nelson's brigade's more in the open than I would like, but overall, I think we've got them in a, in a decent position to hopefully stop them. We'll find out. Moving Baxter forward, causing Huntington to shift, so we're going to move Webb further up his flank. We're going to move these skirmishers around this way. And now Huntington's or Hunton is really going to have to expose himself. Meanwhile, you can see Sedgwick is actually kind of holding his own here against overwhelming odds. We're actually going to move these guys forward as well on the double. Move Deering back. We've got Hines in reserve of this battle line here in case anything goes wrong. But I'm going to move Henry up because between Hood and Anderson, Sedgwick and Bass are a little bit... Uh, in, in a dangerous position. They're, they're not horribly outnumbered, but they're certainly not... Um, you know, they could be better. The only bad thing here is Henry's going to be kind of in the open. So if the enemy does kind of decide to aim at him rather than Sedgwick, he, uh, he may be exposed. He's blocked by these skirmishers. We're going to move Bass's skirmishers up and around. I didn't realize Bass wasn't shooting at anything. He shouldn't be blocked anymore. And he's not. Firing into Hood's Hood at point blank range. And now I've got Bass firing into Hood's flank. Granite, the Confederates up here are in much better terrain. That's a really long range for Baxter to try and engage at. Do I hear someone charging? I swear I hear a melee. Jenkins could be a threat here on our flank. Alright, so we've stopped Hood Cold, it looks like. A little bit of maneuvering, I think, helped us out. Come on, Henry, fire into Drayton's flank. Alright, Loomis is in a melee now. I'm kind of shifting some brigades fire around a bit to try and help. And actually the artillery can fire canister at that range. Loomis appears to be running. But we've stopped the enemy too. We've routed the enemy. Alright, there you go. So Loomis is falling back. Move Hines up there to help him out. Overall, things seem to be holding well. Gonna get a little bit aggressive here. Move Baxter and Webb onto Wilson's flank and try and roll up the rebel line. And apparently an enemy brigade is coming up to our rear. So actually we're gonna move Hines up. We'll move Loomis back too. So we're going to shift a couple brigades back. 
We did we did leave one back in reserve, so that's ideal. Although Law is a little bit large for us to try and deal with him just with one brigade. So I'm moving overwhel hopefully what should be overwhelming forces back to deal with the threat. Meanwhile, I'm moving Baxter and Wilcox in to hit the rebels in the flank here. Do I have two basses? I feel like I'm saying bass a lot. Now these guys are going to end up in the open, which is not what I'm thrilled about. Oh, shit. Oh, they can fire right into the rear of Jenkins. I'd rather they do that than respond to... Uh, to Wilcox here, and they just did. Nice. Alright, so we've got three brigades up here dealing with law. Our Northern Flake's taking some casualties, but they're also doing some damage. Our artillery's low on ammo, gonna shift the wagon down there. Wilcox should give him a good volley web. There you go, and he's running. And now Nelson can come up Drayton's uh, flank. I think there's one brigade. I think there's a Brigade under Jenkins that hasn't hasn't routed yet, but we just unraveled more or less their whole line. Again, they still have law, but we've got three brigades in line firing into him. He's outnumbered almost three to one. Drayton's retreating could pose a flank, or flank threat to Baxter, but that's why we've got Nelson here shooting into his side. Skirmishers here. I think we're, we're two-thirds of the way into the battle. Things seem to be going okay at the moment. Cedric's blocked by Henry, huh? Oh, well, I guess apparently not. Oh, don't run or melee or anything stupid like that. Yikes, Nelson just took a big volley in his flank. Flankers become the flanked, apparently. No, I'm going to have you fall back. Loomis is killed. We're losing quite a couple of generals here I'd rather not lose. I'm actually going to pull back a little bit. I think I got a little bit over aggressive here. We'll pull back to our main line. Bass back here. I think we're still holding, holding well. All right, so Webb fell back a bit. We'll hold him in position there. I don't want to take any unnecessary casualties. Should win this thing hands down at, by this point. You can see here Law is... Oh, where are you going? All right, so... Whoa. Well, that charge by course didn't last long. Hedrick's guys are reloading really quickly. Not sure what weapon that is. 
Henry needs to fall back too. He wandered into the volley fire of hunting there. We'll web back to this tree line here to deal with Jenkins as he comes up. So pull Baxter back here a bit. And we'll move Nelson over here. Henry's falling back. Cedric and Bash should be in good shape. As, uh, as these enemies move forward for hopefully what's the last attempt to deal us a blow. The enemy flank attack fell apart. The enemy northern attack fell apart. And now they've just kind of got brute force couple of brigades coming across the open. Webb took a, a bit of a bloody nose, but he's fallen back into reasonable defensive position in these woods here. Wilcox is being held up by Deering's skirmishers at the very least. Eek. Jenkins has to have pretty good weapons there. Still, we've got two brigades in tw only 20 minutes, so I think we can hold. Alright, we're gonna move Henry down, just in case. Wilcox are going to hopefully prevent, uh, or Deering will, it looks like Wilcox is trying to flank Webb. My hope is he can he can get stopped from doing that. Webb isn't in as good a cover as I would like. But Drayton's flank is kind of open as well, the Baxter's getting men. They're going to bother shooting at him, yes they do. Either you guys fire volley fire. All right, Deering's gone. Still only 15 minutes. So should be able to hold him off. Kind of surprised Drayton isn't retreating after all the punishment he's taken. Rear flanked. Yeah. Got to go deal with uh, with Law. He's firing into the rear of Bass again. Most of this I think is academic. I think the fight's more or less decided by now. Webb is pulling back. Henry's the next obstacle. 11 minutes left. We'll send Deering and, and Loomis over to the actual objective point. I don't think they'll get there in time, but... If it falls, you'll, you have a little bit of extra time to kind of, you know, attempt to retake it. It extends the battle a little bit. Henry's in reserve there. You guys close in a bit with Law. Give him a good, a good, not buck and ball, but a good full-throated volley there. Not doing much there. These guys don't have very good weapons. All right, we'll fast forward here. Should be the end of this battle. And it is. We win. All right, so we lost 3,000 men. The enemy lost 8,000. So 3,000 casualties, still probably more than I would like. Uh, but nonetheless, victory, no guns lost, no guns taken. If we go to uh, goods captured, you can see here we lost 3,000 men. We captured about 1,600 of our own weapons, so a little bit less, around half. But we also captured an additional 1,500, so we ended up about netting out. These Enfields probably will sell, although there's a lot of them. We might be able to out outfit a unit with them. We'll definitely be selling the MJ, MJ and G and the Sharps 1855s. Um, the Lorenzas and Springfields we'll, we'll put to use given that we've got units with those. Alright, so the next battle is actually going to be Second Manassas. Um, you can see here we got four reputation and one more career point, so we need to decide how we want to use that career point. Um, I'm thinking given that we're probably unlikely to need to expand that, we're not going to add another division to all of our cores at this point. 
Um, so I think, and you can see here again, we're still undefeated. I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and add another medicine, uh, which will give us an additional boost for reinforcements that come back just automatically. So you get kind of an increase in walking wounded that come back to your army. So you lose casualties during the battle, but you can actually recoup some of those between battles. Um, so actually, maybe we'll do politics, which uh, we've got enough gold, I think, and enough recruits at the moment. So we'll go with medicine. Um, so that's the additional perk we'll take. Um, we'll go back to the barracks. William Nelson wounded, John Sedgwick wounded. Uh, we got one more commander back, I believe it is. Um, although apparently not, because we don't have anyone in reserve. All right, let's take a look and see who needs to be replaced. Sedgwick needs to be replaced. We'll have to put a colonel in his spot. Oh, that's cheaper. Well, maybe a lieutenant colonel even. Give him a lieutenant colonel. Hines uh, needs to be upgraded. Looms needs to be replaced. Again, we'll probably go with a new, another lieutenant colonel to save some money. And I think for all of these guys, we're going to just give them regular rookie replacements. It's a lot of money to go with veterans. You can see here in this case, really no benefit. You lose a little bit of experience here, but not, not a huge amount when they didn't lose a ton of casualties. This guy lost a bit more. Nelson's unit lost a bit more. So you can see there's a bit of a bigger hit, but I still think it's marginal to go with uh, rookie replacements there. Because again, then you get free replacements if you have the weapons, which in many of these cases we do. And this is the lesser experienced of the uh, cores. The first core is largely veterans. Uh, this core is almost all green or, or much greener. So you don't take as much of a penalty when you're replacing troops on, on kind of more mediocre regiments or, or brigades, technically. Okay, so there you go. We've got... Oh, no, we haven't replaced all of them. We've got to go ahead and replace um, Webb's Brigade. we got to go ahead and replace Bass's Brigade. Sir, yes, sir. But that does it. So we replaced all our casualties. We still have 9,000 men in reserve. And we've got some units that have some upgrades that we need to go ahead and give them. So these guys will get a stamina, efficiency, or speed. Or you can go with morale and efficiency. I'm going to go with morale and efficiency. Uh, I think that's the biggest perk for the Union. Um, with the artillery, it's a little bit different. I think efficiency is more important, and ammunition as well. I always seem to run out of ammo, especially in the larger battles. So go with ammunition and efficiency there. You can see that's a nice little boost for that artillery battery. And for Baxter's boys, we're going to go with uh, uh, morale and efficiency as well. All right, so there you go. Um, all of those guys are upgraded. The first core doesn't have anything to upgrade. Everything is fully built out in the first core and the second core. We've got two fully, uh, fully featured cores, if you will. And then we've got the third core, which we need to go ahead and build. And we've got $100,000 to do it and 9,000 recruits to do it. We've already got one artillery battery in the core. So we're going to go ahead and build an infantry brigade. We're going to go ahead and select a colonel, uh, Duncan Foreman. It's going to cost 3000 for him. And then we've got some... I think we'll actually give them Enfields because we... we Captured over 2,000 of them, so we do have to pay the, you know, to get it the full size, we do have to spend the 20 grand, but I think it's worth it to have a really high quality weapon, kind of the feature of one of the brigades in this core. So we'll go ahead and do that. You can see here we uh, added Foreman's Brigade, and then we're going to go ahead and add another brigade. These guys will be a little bit more basically armed, I think. Let's take a look through and see if there's any other weapons we can really outfit them with. Doesn't look like it. We don't have any other spares. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and outfit them just kind of with the... I hate to outfit them with the Springfield 1842, but we just don't have a lot of other cheap options. This this would be almost 40 grand if we wanted to go with Lorenz's. We don't have enough Enfields at all in the shop to outfit them. We could go with the Springfields, but that would be over 50,000. The Harper's Ferry would be even more. So really, I think maybe we go with the Lorenz's. Maybe we go with spending half our mon remaining money we don't have a ton of recruits, it's not like we can build out a full core. Maybe we just go with Lorenz's. Um, so I guess this will be... Eh, I don't know. Kind of wouldn't mind build, giving uh, some of our other units better weapons. So let's take a look at our first core. The first core has... The first division all has good weapons. All Springfields are Lorenz's. The second division has almost all Springfield or Lorenzo's. We've got one unit with Springfield, 1842 smooth bores. So we're actually going to give these guys Lorenzo's as well. We'll spend that 40,000 there. 
Um, so there you go. That second division is now fully rifled. Uh, the third division is almost rifled. We've got one brigade with 1842s, but I don't think we've got enough money. We need $54,000. We've only got 42. Let's see if there's anything in the armory we can sell. Captured 154 sharps, which we don't need. And then we've got some M and J type twos we don't need. Still a little bit short. If we wanted to outfit these guys with rifles, it would allow us to get the whole first core would all be rifled if we could do it. Doesn't look like we've got enough money to do it. All meadow would be a slight increase in cost. It really would only give you a slight benefit in melee. Ugh. Um. Well, we don't need a 20. Well, we can't shrink the battery. Wouldn't, I kind of half wouldn't mind selling for those artillery pieces, but there's not really any value in doing that. So let's go ahead and do this first. Let's go ahead and get a uh, lieutenant colonel in command of this brigade. We've got the, we've already got the Springfield's uh, 1842s, the smooth bores. So we're going to go ahead and uh, select that. We've got another brigade there. Um... The other alternative is taking Bass out of the first corps, putting him in the third, and then taking this newly raised uh, brigade under Foreman and putting it in the first. So by doing that, by just moving troops around, we've ensured that the entire first corps has very good weapons between Lorenz's 1855s. All very good, high-quality weapons are in the first corps. The second corps, I think it's all 1842s. No, we've got one unit with Lorenz. We've got two units with Lorenzes in the in the second corps, but it's mostly 1842s. And then um, the third corps will obviously all also be crappy weapons. Now this is a problem as we get further into the war, because the further and further you get into this war, uh, the the bigger the detriment uh, for having poor weapons. Um, with that being said, it's really all we can afford, and I do want the manpower. We're going to go ahead and uh, buy a third brigade of uh, 1842s. Then we're going to go ahead and increase their supply. We're going to spend some money to get their supply up to 15,000, which I think is where we're going to sit. Eh, let's let's get them up to 16,000. Again, I always run out of supply with these wagons, so if we can rely on not having to capture enemy units, that would be great. So the first division is built out in its entirety. So we've got two cores of 16 and 18,000 men respectively, so that's 34,000 men. And then we've got one division. So we've got an army of 40,000 men, which isn't far off. I think the Union Army was around 50,000 men at 2nd Manassas. Just going by memory, it could be off a bit there. Um, but from history, we only have 3,800 more recruits. We could spend 18 of our prestige on $120,000 and build out a whole nother division. We wouldn't have quite enough to get manpower perks as well. Um, but I don't really think, I don't want to spend my reputation that way. Because if we were to lose the Battle of Second Bull Run, we'll take a 25 prestige hit. If we were to spend, what was it again? If we were to spend um, 18 of that, then we'd only be left with uh, some 29. So basically, we'd be on the on the borderline of getting fired, and we'd have all sorts of morale penalties if we were to do it. Additionally, we've got a morale boost right now. Uh, because of our, uh, because of the quality of our, the amount of victories we have, uh, and our reputation, and I don't want to sacrifice that. So the first core is built, second core is built, third core is in progress. Now, if we were to go to Bull Run, we were to go ahead and jump ahead. The benefit is we're going to see the enemy army reduced in size by about five percent uh, due to our previous victories. If we were to go in and start, uh, our intelligence isn't great, but it's saying there's only 5,000 enemy soldiers, I assume, in this first battle, uh, which is, I assume, the battle uh, where the Iron Brigade was attacked kind of at the uh, at the pinnacle or the initial attack that Jackson launched against him to surprise him at Manassas Junction. First Corps leading the way, Second Corps is part of the main army, Third Corps could be part of the main army, or we could have as a rear guard. Um, I'm not sure which makes more sense. Given that it is so small and it is so green, I think a rear guard might make some sense. Um, I'm not quite sure how we want to handle that. You do have to have a vanguard. You know, we could. We could have these rookies, the small brigade, 
uh, be the vanguard, and then we could have the main, the first and second corps be the main army. That might actually be an interesting strategy to try out. It would be very under strength for the vanguard, but I think we're only going up against a single confederate division in the vanguard battle. Um, it might be an intriguing, intriguing thing to try out. With that being said, we're 45 minutes in today, guys, so that's going to do it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, tomorrow you'll see another episode of Panzer Corps, followed by another, probably another episode of Ultimate General Civil War, fighting the Battle of Second Manassas uh, in the, uh, the follow-on day. And then again, switching back over to Panzer Corps. So Panzer Corps every other day, Ultimate General Civil War every other day, Cold Waters, as I've been saying for a couple of, uh, maybe over a week now, will be returning uh, look for it this weekend, guys. All right, thanks for tuning in once again, and until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.